So we're gonna, I'll show you what I can do to get working with textures. First, I've got the easy examples working, but I'm still stuck on a, little, on a couple ideas. All right, so here is a simple Well, first, let's first just run it so you can see what it does. This is the one we were looking at. See, there, there's the there's the texture and the texture tilted away from us 45 degrees. Okay, so it finally worked. Okay, so what did you change? Uh, okay. We needed the spike buffer. So we were right about this guy. So that was a big step. You know, we converted that array to a byte buffer by calling this wrap function. That was the one, that was the, that was right. But we were still missing the only thing. We were we were still missing. These two lines of code here, I think they were. Now, here's the original C program that I'll clone. This is from the original, you know, this is the original OpenGL tutorial. So I was cloning this example here, okay? And no, those lines are there. No, there wasn't those two lines. There was some line missing. Boy, I wish I could move that up. I don't remember now. You know, we were right about the, there was something else missing. Oh, I know. Um, we had to convert this guy from, in the original C, it's a three-dimensional array. In the original C, it's a three-dimensional array, rows, columns, color. Okay, Java doesn't want it that way. Java wants it to be a one-dimensional array, and then you have to do your own indexing in it. You have to do it as a, a row major array. So uh, this is a common, common, common trick. I think we talked about, I think we've mentioned this trick before. You think of a two dimensional array like this. Here's a two dimensional array with three rows and four columns. Okay. Now, in C, that is stored in memory the following way. So, memory is just an array of, you know, a one dimensional array. So you, this is row one, this, I'm sorry, this is row zero, row one, row two. So in memory, you put row zero, row one, row two. Okay. Now that means that it doesn't really matter if you declare this as a byte, or if you declare it as a, well, say uh, this would be three by four or by 12. And they don't look different. This is convenient to use, but they're exactly the same thing. This is 12 cells, you know, three rows of four. Okay, 
So this is really this. So these are more or less the same thing, right? So in C, it doesn't really matter from the point of view of OpenGL if you declare it as a three-dimensional array or as a one-dimensional array. Now, go to Java. So this is C. In Java, you want this guy. So byte three, four versus byte 12. These are not at all the same thing. In C, same thing. In Java, they're not. What's this guy in Java? Yes, yeah, Jack. So, so what does it look like? This guy, which we think of as this, looks like this in memory. Row, 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 just next to each other. What does this look like in memory? Seven, seven, seven. I mean, it would be seven. It's a like three and a four. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's like a, it doesn't come out as a grid. Those are just the links of the rows. Java uses it something called the array of rows technique. This is called row major technique. This is called row major. There's a Fortran uses column major. Do you know what that means? Same thing except it goes, it does pretty Yeah, it puts that column in memory for so uh, Fortran, Fortran would do it the following way. It would do column zero, columns one, column two, column three. Now be the same amount of memory. Okay. This is called column major. This one's called row major. Java doesn't use column major or row major. Column, Java uses a third technique called array of rows. And C++ also uses the array of rows technique. C++ does this or the array of rows. Fortran does column major, C does row major, C++ does uh, row major or array of rows. So what's array of rows? Does anybody remember, what's the th does anybody remember what the third technique is? C++ also uses it. What did I just draw? This is the array of rows. The first entry is that row of length four. This is row one. This is row two. So you're allocating four objects. One object is the array of rows, and then the other three objects are the row objects. Okay. Now, in a sense, look, this, this is real close to row major. You know, if you stack these guys on top of each other, it'd be like row major. But these are objects in the heap, so they're not stacked on top of each other. Okay. Now, here's okay. Now, think about what C does. C does this. What if you want to traverse this array? This is very fast to traverse. For example, even if it's declared this way, you can traverse it this way, and that's very friendly to the cache of the CPU. This is probably going to be mostly one cache line in the CPU. So you can just whip right through this. This is nightmarish. This, this, this is okay for, for some things. It's terrible for any kind of high performance computing. This is one of the places where Java just fails. Java's two dimensional arrays, since they are in, in what we call array of rows form, they're scattered all over the heap and they're terrible from the point of view of cache management. Uh, uh, caches. If you want to go through this array real fast, 
You have to access this array, get a pointer to that guy, step through those, then go back to here, get a pointer to that guy, step through those, then go back to here, get a pointer to that guy, step through those. Okay? So when you're translating this C into Java, you do not translate this thing into this thing. Why not? Well, uh, it doesn't matter. This is well. This is in memory, so this is in memory too. Now, if I actually, if I drew this in memory, what it would look like in memory is the following. So here's memory. Over here would be the array of rows. Then here would be row one. Here would be row two. Here would be row three, and here would be row four. They're just in the heap. Okay. So why don't I use this? They are not continuously like stored together. So what's wrong with that? You need something to reference. Well, I, I, I have Java. This works. This works, so I don't want to use it. If it works, but I don't want to use it, why would I not want to use it if it works? It works, it's correct, but I don't want to use it. What's the standard reason for not wanting to use something when it's correct? Slow, bad performance. It's just too bad performance wise. So when you take that kind of array in C and translate to Java, you can't, look, you can't take this. Now C can take this because this and this are the same thing. This and this actually in memory are stored the same way. These two are that contiguous chunk of memory. So from the point of view of C, it doesn't matter if you declare it this way or you declare it this way, you get the same high performance memory layout. In Java, if you do this, you're really messed up. You have to do this. And then, but when you do it this way, you have to index into this array yourself. You can't use double bracket notation. You have to write your own index into the, into the array. So that's, and that's the mistake I made when, when in class. See here how he's using double bracket. He's actually using triple bracket notation. Okay. I throw J column zero. I throw J column R, G, B uh, transparency. Okay, so he can use triple bracket notation. Row zero, row one, row two. How do you get to row zero if you're using this notation? You gotta skip over the rows ahead. You have to skip over rows. Yeah, I remember now, you guys saw this when you were trying to do some of the pixel manipulations in the first homework assignment. You had to worry about, we had a sub, like when you had a sub array of pixels inside of a larger array of pixels, you had to do this kind of indexing yourself. Real, real similar kind of thing. You have to index yourself. Okay, so now watch what this, here's the C code. Here's what it turns to in Java. I throw is I times three times 64 because each row is 64 bytes with RGB. So there's 194 bytes to a row. So if you want to be in the I row, you have to say I times that. I forgot the three. Yeah, I forgot the three. I remembered 64, but I forgot there's RGB. Yeah, it was RGB, 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 RGB. I forgot the threes, so everything was all messed up. We have four, right? Three. I dropped the, I, I dropped the, the four. The, I thought that might have been the problem that maybe Java didn't like the fourth one, so I dropped it. So I, I cut it down to three. I cut it from four to three because we weren't using the transparency anyway. So I thought maybe that would make it simpler. So I dropped the transparency one. Okay, so I forgot those. So then. When you go across a row, when you want to be in column J, it's J times three, because because each column is RGB, RGB, RGB. So I forgot that three also. So I had I times sixty four plus J, and I forgot the three here and the three here. So I forgot the RGB. So that that then I was indexing all wrong. Okay, right. so 
Now, here, this is actually a row major array. So here, he could, you could use this notation or you could use this notation, you get the same thing because it's stored in memory the same way. In Java, if you try to use this notation, this notation must be stored this way. In C++, you can actually do something clever. You can, you can use this notation when it's stored this way. Okay. But in Java, you can't. In Java, to use this notation, it must be stored this way. Okay. There's no option in Java to tell Java, I got a two-dimensional array stored in row major form, and let me use double index notation. I wish they would. It wouldn't be hard for them to add that to the language. You, it'd be a new kind of an array, but it'd be a, 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 a two-dimensional array stored in row major form that allows you to use double bracket notation. They could do it, but they don't. So if you need a two-dimensional array and you can't abide by this because it's too low performance, then you have to use a one-dimensional array and you've got to index yourself. You got to write that kind of index yourself. Now, what's wrong with that? It's ripe for mistakes. It's real easy to goof up this indexing notation. That's what I did. I forgot the threes. And if I decide to put uh, A in there, like the, yeah, then I have to remember to go through and change all those threes to fours. Yeah, unless I declare a constant somewhere that is the, yeah. And then you, that's why people have huge numbers of constants at the beginning of their programs. I should have a constant for this and a constant for this. And this would be the constant that says, uh, you know, color size color size three or color. Now, RG, now OpenGL does that. In OpenGL, we'll see later, we're going to have to keep using little constants to say RGB three, RGB four, because OpenGL needs to know, are you using three bytes for color, four bytes for color, two bytes for color? Yeah. So you, you, they have, and they have constants for all that. Okay. So that was the main mistake. Once the, the thing we figured out was that we had to convert from array to buffer. And we had the right code to do that, but I had written the indexing code wrong. So this thing, the threes were missing here and they were missing here, okay? And again, the, the C language is kind of nice since they know their array looks like this anyway, they could treat it as a two-dimensional array and use the nice notation, but get the performance of the row major array. So they get the performance of this while they get to use the, they get the performance of this with the notation of that. That's pretty clever. Performance of this with notation of that, but Java eh, doesn't have it. C++ does. I can get the performance of this with the notation of this to C++, not in Java. So in Java, everywhere where OpenGL allowed multidimensional arrays, Java only allows one-dimensional arrays, and you've got to do your own indexing inside of them. So, so now Java could have said, okay, we'll let you use multi-dimensional arrays. But Java says the performance is gonna be so bad, you're gonna complain. If we let you use these, then you will be complaining to us endlessly, like why is Java so slow? Why does my programs in Java run slower than they do in C++ and C? And the answer is because they're using, they're letting you use these, which are too slow. So they force you to do, uh, they force you to use row major. And, and do your own indexing. Okay. So they force you to use row major and to do your own indexing. And everywhere in the Java graphics library, it isn't even just Joggle. They, Java enforces this in all their own graphics libraries. All of Java's graphics libraries, the image processing libraries, the, the, uh, the, um, the libraries for manipulating pictures, they're all one dimensional arrays. Even though the picture is a two dimensional object, they're one dimensional arrays and you've got to index into them yourself the hard way. Okay, so and there, you know, there's the picture we wanted to get, which we got. Okay, so now let's look at the outline of the code. Okay, the constructor isn't any different. The fact that we're doing uh, textures has no effect on the constructor of the Java app. So that, that code doesn't change. Okay. Here's the function that generates that image, that little the checkerboard. Here's the init, okay? Init now has to initialize, it has to turn on textures. So now 
the lines I commented out are mostly lines that some people have in their code and some people don't have in their code. And I commented out because they turn out not to have to be there. So I left in the lines of code that were in the original examples, but turn out if you commented them out, doesn't change the behavior. So uh, I, I set a clear color of gray. I could set the shading mode and enable depth testing. But since this example is just a flat surface, there doesn't need to be any depth testing. So those didn't really need to be turned on. Okay, I'm setting the size of my picture. Uh, these are just two alternative. I, I rewrote the code to make image so that we could get different checkerboard patterns. So like this is a, instead of an eight by eight checkerboard, this would be four rows and eight columns. So I rewrote, I just, I, th I thought it was kind of fun to just get different kinds of checkerboards. So I, I actually wrote a different version of that make image that lets you do things like change the, the, uh, the, the dimensions of the checkerboard. Okay. Here's another function. I can't figure out what this does, but you don't need it. So it was in the original code, but I commented it out and nothing changed. So I left it commented out, at least for now. Okay. This is real important. This tells OpenGL that you're gonna use one texture and you're gonna have an array of, now you, OpenGL is bizarre. The name of the array is texture names. They're not a names of textures. What it is is every texture is just gonna have an integer associated to it. So there's texture zero, texture one, texture two, texture three. And so I have to have an array of texture integers. And uh, it's just gonna be an array with zero. Now this is an array with one texture image. So it's declared up here as an array of size one. Okay, so I have an array of size one, so I'm gonna use one texture. If I was gonna use two textures, I need an array of size two here. And that array is just gonna hold the numbers zero one or zero one two, which sounds really redundant unless you do something. I think what happens is, if you like, if you have twenty textures and then you delete some of them, you won't. You, you know, you could, then you could have textures one, two, three, seven, eight, nine. You know, you might skip some textures. So, so they they let you have an array of texture numbers. Okay, so you have to declare this array of texture numbers. Then you, then you say here, binding a texture is saying. This is the texture I'm gonna work on for now. So only one texture is active at a time. So even if you've got a thousand textures in your game, at any given time, since it's a state machine, the state machine says, I'm gonna work on one texture at a time. So you bind the texture from in that array to, you, so you bind texturing to one particular texture. Like in this case, it's gonna be zero. Okay, so you say how many textures there are, then you say, I'm gonna work with this one. Then you parameterize that texture. So these things, like these two, we don't need. These two, I'll show you, say what they do later on. Then here's where you load the texture data into the GP, the graphics card. Basically, this is saying load that texture into the graphics card. And you tell it how wide and how high the graphics, the GPU, the, the image is. Notice here where I say RGB, RGB. If it was an RGBA, texture, I would put RGBA here. We'll see, you do it twice because what you're doing is you're grabbing a texture from over here and giving it to the GPU over there. And for, and I'll show you an example in a minute where sometimes you grab it one way and you give it to the GPU a different way. So with some of the textures, I had to grab it as BR, BGR and give it to the GPU as RGB. And I still don't understand why, but I was drawing some textures and they came out wacky. And then I fixed them by change. I, I noticed that the colors were swapped. I looked at the texture and I go, I know what's wrong there. The red and the green are, the red and the blue are swapped. I could like look at it and say, but the red and blue have been swapped. So I changed this from RGB to BRG and the picture came out fine. Okay, so weirdness, things like that. So you're saying to the GPU, here's the color of the source in that order. And here's the color of the destination. And this is the source and this is the destination. This is the image file. And this is it being sent to the GPU. Okay, so you have to tell it the RGB twice here. Then the, uh, the, the data we're sending to the GPU is unsigned bytes. And then this is the data being sent to the GPU. Okay, then, then when it comes to display and you actually draw the coordinates, this is what we were talking about on Tuesday. For every vertex, you say what the texture coordinate is. So you say, 
This corner of the texture goes to that corner of my, my polygon. This corner of the texture goes to that corner of my polygon. This corner of the texture goes to that corner. This corner goes to that corner. Then this was the one that's tilted away from us. Same four corners of the texture, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. Same four corners of the texture. But now the four corners of the geometry are tilted away from us. You know, these, these guys are farther back. So that's, that's instead of a rectangle being flat like this, it's a rectangle tilted away from us. So put that corner of the texture at that vertex, put that corner at that vertex. And then you know, all the actual texturing is then, everything's been set up now so that when you say this texture coordinate on this vertex, well, we're only got one texture, so it uses that one texture, okay? Now, I can change the texture by calling this, this function that uh, builds textures. So for example, instead of using the checkerboard texture, can use the uh, that fractal, that little fractal texture. See, there's there's that like fractal like texture. If you want to see it looking better, set it to 256. Like that was a 64 bit by 64 bit fractal. Now it's going to be 256 bits by 256 bits. Looks a little bit better. Yeah. And if you want, you can make it bigger or smaller. And then you can also use a different checkerboard. Like here's a checkerboard that's got four rows and eight columns now. So I rewrote the I wrote the I rewrote the code that generates the checkerboard. So now you can tell how many rows and how many columns. So four rows. So now the checkerboard is not squares, they're little rectangles. So, and you know, you could make this as detailed as you want. So for example, 64 rows and uh, 32 columns. Okay. Now, it, yeah, we're now pushing the, the, uh, the resolution of the screen. This looks a little bit better if I you know, maximize it, okay? This one looks fine. Notice that this one, when it's starting to get tilted away from you, it starts getting a little bit weird. You know, the texture starts looking maybe like it's almost warped or something. And that, that's got to do with what's called aliasing effects. You're starting to almost, if I made this thing like a checkerboard of like 256 by 256, it would start looking really weird. Yeah. Okay. Actually, you can go ahead and do that. It won't complain. See what it looks like. So the checkerboard's got 256 columns and 256 rows. It's actually, I'll make it a 1024 bit bitmap. So there's plenty of resolution. Now see the one on the right? Yeah, not both of them. You're seeing what are called more patterns. And, you know, when the checkerboard is the checkerboard is way beyond the resolution of the screen. And you get these, actually some people love these. There's people who draw these moray patterns just as artwork. So they purposely overload the resolution of the screen just to see what weird effects happen. So they're, they're called, they're, they're, uh, they're a famous example of people playing around with op art. I think that's it. There are these things called more ray patterns. They show up in low resolution scans of like newspapers and stuff like that. You see them a lot in older newspapers when you're printing at a lower resolution than like a magazine. And then you can also get them by just artificially increasing, like here, just drawing a, a checkerboard has got way too many checkers to display and you get these weird patterns. Like looking over here, you get these really, yeah, like little dots and like, you know, it's, it's real strange what you can get. 
Oh, you don't see, actually, you don't see it very well. You have to come up here to see that it's something it's doing really, there just as like a blur but if you come up here it's actually doing real interesting little patterns there's little mini patterns in on the screen there's little there's little mini patterns of circles and squares and dots okay and this is actually one of the big issues with texturing if you don't do texturing carefully you get screwy stuff like this yeah texturing has to be done really carefully if you if you don't pay attention to the resolution of your textures you can you can get more patterns now, let's look at another example of texture. Here's a texture from a, 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 a file. Okay. The texture is going to come loaded out of a file. Okay. So, this is a texture. I like this texture a lot because. It's, it's a good demo texture. It's used by 3J, it comes from the 3JS library. They use it to build this example here. It's a real pretty example. And they, they're using that texture on these geometric objects. And here they're using it because it just looks neat. But the texture is, the thing that's, that's nice about this texture, besides looking kind of nice, is it's really well designed. You can figure out what's going on. Like this is the texture that told me that I had uh, art, red, green, blue, purple, okay? Suppose somehow your red and green are being swapped. You'll see, see how, you know what, see this is the zero, zero corner and this is the one, zero corner. Those are the texture coordinates. So there's the zero, zero texture coordinate. There is the one, zero texture coordinate. The one, zero texture coordinate better be, the, better be where the green is. If the green shows up over here, you've got R and you got red and green swapped. Okay, also what this is good for is if you've got your picture upside down or flipped over, you'll see. See, it tells you exactly where the texture coordinates are. And you can also do interesting experiments. Like suppose I want to go from here to here in the texture. I mean, here is a texture coordinate 0 0.2 and vertically it's 0 0.2. Yeah, and over here it's 0 0.2 and 0 point, well, 0 0.6, 0 0.2. 0 0.6 this way, see that's line 0 0.6, 0 0.2 up. So that's 0 0.6 to here and 0 0.2 up. So I can, I can do a test pattern. You know, I can check if my code is working right because I can pinpoint that point there and that point there and do a texture from there to there. And I should see exactly that part there. It's real nice. It, besides looking nice, you know, besides being a nice looking texture, because it makes this example look really kind of neat. You know, besides being a good looking texture, it's a, real edu it's a real informative texture. It's really good for debugging purposes. Okay. Okay, so that's the texture I'm loading right now, but I have a whole folder here of other textures. So now let's look at the code. Constructor is the same. The init method doesn't change too much except that you load the texture file. So setting up textures is the same as it was before, but instead of the texture data being computed by a function, it's gonna be loaded by some file manipulation. So there's the name of the texture. And then you just open that file, uh, read that file. You have to do a successive, but this is, the, this is what you need uh, tutorials and um, Stack Overflow for. Uh, like you don't just open this file and get the data out of it. You have to open the file, like look how many steps it takes. Read the file into a buffer in. Then you have to take the data out of the buffer image and make it a raster. Then you have to take the data out of the raster, you take the data out of the raster and pass it to a data byte buffer, get data again, no, get the data buffer out of that and then get the data again. So you need uh, one, two, three, four steps with like five different classes just to get the data out of the uh, image file. Now, you know, now, why doesn't, open, why doesn't Java just have one function that grabs the data? That's not the Java way. 
The Java way is to have a bunch of functions that do little steps. It's up to you to chain them together. Yeah. yeah. Instead of them having one big function that does this and one big function that does that, one big function that does this, you just call that one big function. That's not the Java way. It's not the C way either. The C way is to have 20 little functions that you can piece together in a hundred different ways and do all kinds of different stuff. So you have to know what order to do these. The trouble is it's hard to get the order right. It's, you know, if you get the order wrong, you guess, you don't get error messages, you just get lousy data. Yeah. So in this case, it's read the data out of the file, then get the data out of the buffer, convert it to a raster, take the raster and cast it, get the data buffer out of the raster, then get the data out of the data buffer. Yeah, just, yeah. You wouldn't, yeah, unless you've been reading those manuals and memorized them, you would never, you, the, the, the thing, the reason this thing is a problem is they have all these little functions. You're supposed to build them together like Lego blocks. But think about it. What's the secret to Lego blocks? Why can't you build a lot of nice things out of Lego blocks? They all fit together. They all fit together. These things don't all fit together. There's a gazillion of them and they don't all fit together. So this block here can only fit into these two blocks here, but those two blocks here can only fit into these. Imagine if they gave you Lego pieces and only certain Lego pieces connected to other Lego pieces. You wouldn't be able to build anything. You'd have to have memorized in your head every possible combination of Lego pieces. That's how this ends up being. There's too many Lego blocks and they do not just interconnect. Only some Lego, and you have to do them in the right order. Like this Lego box gotta come before this Lego block and this gotta come after that Lego block. It's a Lego block mentality, but they're not like Lego blocks. They don't, inter they're not interchangeable. Okay, so it is notoriously hard to get this stuff working. The people who are good at it have probably almost all memorized the patterns they use. So they use a certain number of patterns and they remember them. And then they call themselves experts. But if you give them a new pattern, most people have a hard time figuring out the right, if, if they're really good, you give them a half an hour, they can probably figure out how to do a new pattern. But you have to go read the documentation and you have to do maybe some trial and error. It can be, if, if you're trying to do a pattern you've never done before, it can sometimes be pretty tricky. So here's a pattern that flows a, a, a texture into, uh, it gives us back an image. Uh, this is an array, this is a byte array. The goal is we want a byte array, but then we take that byte array and we wrap it into a byte buffer. So we end up, you know, we end up unraveling all this stuff into something that's simple, but then at the very end, we have to wrap it back up again. Yeah. So after we've unwrapped it from all these other things, then we have, and it's actually possible that some of those intermediate steps were what we wanted here. I haven't sat down and figured it out, but the, the, the people who write these examples, a lot of times they're not really careful. So they might be doing more unwrapping than they need. So they will sometimes unwrap, 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 then rewrap, 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 and you're right back where you started from. I don't know if, see, we wrap this back into a byte buffer. It might be, but I, I, this probably isn't the case. It might be that one of these intermediate steps would work. Yeah. But I, I have a feeling that's not the case. Let's see how this is a data buffer byte. You know, this guy might be something we could directly feed to the, uh, OpenGL, but I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't guarantee it, okay? So this, this opens a file and, and gets the data out of it, and it gives us the exact same kind of thing. See, it's still gonna be a byte array. So just like the other example, the other example we did, we declared the byte array and filled it with, back, you know, here we fill it with data ourselves. We compute, this is called a procedural texture. And in the broad scheme of things, we call those, because people write beautiful code to compute really beautiful textures that aren't from photographs. So there's all kinds of people who create code to generate, like a real famous example is marble. Suppose you want to have a marble room. You don't want to go out and load 57 files of marble textures so that you can get different looks. What you really want is code that'll just generate marble patterns for you. So there's real famous examples of code that'll generate very realistic looking marble patterns. It's called, uh, the, the most famous one is called Perlin noise. Okay, so procedural textures are real common. They're usually used when you want something that looks randomish, like marble, bark, uh, grass, 
you want a texture that looks like grass, it might be easier just to, to procedurally compute it than to have a picture that stores it. So this is a procedural texture. And then this one over here is an image file texture. Okay? And if I change the image file, here's a brick texture. Now, there's the brick, okay? Two things that are a little bit interesting about this. Here's the original brick pattern. Notice that the original brick pattern is actually real old fashioned graphic stuff, 64 bits by 64 bits. You know, why did, you know, back in the you know, early days of the internet, people had little image files because you had to download these things. So you try to use as little image files as you can. When you scale that thing up, you have to create new data. There's only 64 pixels here. There's hundreds of pixels over here. Where's that new data come from? Do you see what they did? Why does that picture look crummy? Well, what do they do? They, you've got 64 pixels. Think of the bottom edge, 64 pixels. Now you need 500 pixels. What do you do with the 64 to get 500? You, you take the first pixel and you either repeat it a bunch of times, and then you take the second pixel and repeat it a bunch of times, and you take the third pixel, or you do another possibility. There's two. There's two possibilities. This is called interpolation. Okay, so here's the pixel. Here's pixel zero and pixel one. Now I need pixel zero, pixel five, pixel 10 here. Okay, what should I put between? Okay, then pixel zero goes here, pixel one goes here, pixel two goes here. What do I put here, 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 and here? Copies of this one, or averaging. Yeah, yeah. Either now copying is fast, so some people use the copying. Averaging is slow, so unless you have a computer that's fast enough to do the averaging, you you do the copying if your computer is old and can't do the averaging, and you do the averaging if it can. Over here, I'm not sure what they did. I think they may have copied because this is really crummy looking. So they probably were copying the pixels. Okay. So you end up with something that doesn't look so good, okay? Now, in the configuration of the texture, see this GL texture, minimize GL texture, magnify. This is where you tell OpenGL what to do here, how to put these guys in between. This is saying when you magnify, use the nearest Okay, nearest I think is copying. Now I can't remember what's, what some of the other ones. I, there's what I we um, let's see. Let's Google this and see if we can get because I don't think this is the best choice. Let's see if we can get a better. This is the one that I think does copying. Nearest, copies whatever is closest to it. Okay, linear, let's try linear, see if it looks better. This is the one that should just, this is the one that should say, interpolate linearly across. So let's try GL linear, see if that gives us a better looking texture. So let's do GL linear and we'll do both of them. One is if you're gonna shrink the picture and one is if you're gonna grow the picture. So let's try GL linear. Ah. It is a little bit better. Can you see it? On my screen, it's it's not as I thought it would be. I thought it would be bet, more noticeably better 
I think it's only a tiny bit better, okay? I see a difference in these two mostly. This one's more pixelated. This is a, just a little less pixelated. Let's see if there's a better option than linear. Okay, go back to that website. No, we can't, we don't have mit max. So the only, our only choice is nearest or linear. Okay, so linear works a little bit better. Okay, now here's another issue that comes up. In my code, here's where, look, RGB, BGR. This took me an hour to figure out. Okay, RGB here. because you think everything's RGB, 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 RGB. Okay, now run it. Now I had a hunch that there was something wrong with the color, but I couldn't figure out what it was. And it wasn't until I used that other texture that really, yeah, that, then, that, then I realized right away, the red and the blue were being swapped. I had a hunch, I thought maybe the red was just being lost here, but the red and the blue are being swapped. So what were reddish bricks became bluish bricks, okay? And if you go back to the other texture, you can see real clearly what's going wrong. So now go back to the other texture, the de essentially the debugging texture, You can, it, it, this is why the beauty of this texture, it looks okay. Yeah, you don't get a glaring if sense that there's something wrong, but compare it to the, now look, zero, zero is supposed to be red and zero, zero is blue, but look at one, 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 one is red, one, one is blue, but look at one, zero, one, zero is, see, they were, somebody, did, somebody really clever designed this texture. Somebody who knew what to look for, somebody who knew what kinds of things were driving people nuts, designed this texture to find those things. So green is over here, blue is, well, green is supposed to be here, blue, red is, and here, you know, you're told what corner that is, that's the zero, zero corner. So we can see that the red and the blue are being swapped. Then I had to do trial and error. Then when I knew that red and blue are being swapped, believe it or not, I had no idea which one of these were the one to change. Right. Do I change this one or do I change this one? So trial and error says, oh, I changed this one, not this one. I still don't understand why. Yeah, I still don't understand what it is about these images because none of the none of the examples in any of the websites I looked at did this. Okay, they, they I did I did not find anybody switching this one to G uh, G to B G R. Yeah. It, so, but why I did, why did it change? Because I don't know. I think it has something to do with the JPEG image format. It could be that the JPEG image format, oh, I, no, I tried the PNG image format and it still had this problem. No, I feel like when we map the texture uh, area with the vertices, is it that uh, change somewhat? It's just the, it's the RGB part. It's only, it's got nothing to do with the coordinates. It's just the RGB. Yeah, it, it's the R, somehow, the, what instead of it being RGB, one of them, either this guy or this guy, one of them is not RGB, one of them is BGR. And I don't know which one. And somehow this is swapping them. It's, ca it's, causing, it's causing a swap from one to the other. I, yeah, I don't know if I'm loading the image wrong, that maybe I have to do it here because maybe the image is being loaded wrong. And maybe that's why other people don't do this here because maybe they change it when they load the image. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah I, I can't find a good reference about it. So I'm not really sure. Okay. Right, so that's a quirky thing. Um, let me show you, uh, okay, now let's try something else. Now remember, the, 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 the rough strategy is, in a knit, Oh, 
I don't have GL texture. I'm not enabling textures here. Huh. Okay, see here's, this is where you turn on textures. I, this stuff is really weird. I thought I should have had that right there. Let's, let's try some. So turn on textures first. I wasn't turning them on. Okay, I still have to swap these. Okay. The general pattern of using textures is in initialization in the init function. You turn on textures, you tell OpenGL how many you're going to use, then you bind textures to buffers one at a time. Now we're only using one texture. Here. So you we're only we only have one texture image to bind to a texture buffer, but we do that here. This is the function that binds. Well, well, you say that you, you bind OpenGL to a particular texture number, then you load texture into that. You load texture data into it. Okay. Th their naming is kind of op awkward, okay? Then in display, you turn on text, enable texturing. You say which texture you're going to use. So you bind to the so you bind the OpenGL graphics card to a particular texture, and then you start just using that texture. So okay, like if you if you don't bind yourself to I only have one texture, but if I don't bind myself to it, oh, in this case it works. Wow. Probably because there's only one texture. So it actually even works, even if I don't bind to it, it's still. So a lot of these function calls is weird. You're, you're told to make the call. And in some situations, you really don't need to, but you're still told to, because in most situations you need to. So for your, like this fine texture, didn't need to be there. But if I comment out, now this other one, what happens if I comment it out? Now I lost my texture. What if I turn on the other bind? Okay. What if I leave this one off and turn this one on? Will I get my texture back? I'm not even sure. I got something weird. So I didn't get my texture back. Yeah. So I need one of those binds, not both of them, but I need one of them. But if I change the code a little bit, I might need both of them because they tell you to put both of them in there. Put one bind in the initialization when you're initializing the texture. Then when you go to draw the texture, you rebind it to it again. Okay. okay. So go ahead and put the bind. Now this line of code doesn't seem to need to be there. This line of code is in the examples, but I see no difference when I turn it off or turn it on. So I have no idea what it's nearly there for. Maybe in some situations, if you don't have that line there, it will break things. But at least what we're doing, that line doesn't seem to need to be there. If you change the zero to one in the display part, will it affect anything? Which one? Line section. Which one, where? Uh, Which line? Two, one, zero, seven. Pardon me? One, zero, seven. Oh, I don't have a second texture. So I only have one. Yeah, if I put uh, if I put one there, I'll probably crash because I don't have a second texture. So then I would be pointing to, oh, actually, uh, let me crash this thing. Because we were crashing the other day. Oh, here's why, oh, and I thought, uh, here's why we were crashing. I was forgetting to initialize this array. So 
That was one of the mistakes. I forgot to declare that array. Now watch what happens when I forget to declare that array. Oops. I got sent now. Um, oh, it actually this okay. This time the compiler caught that. So let me, but yesterday I didn't initialize it and the compiler didn't catch it because of Now it's not crashing. Now it's not crashing. I was going to show you what the crash is like. Yeah, now I can't even duplicate that crash from last week. Try it on this one. Because I realized something interesting. When it crashed, it crashed the whole Java virtual machine. It didn't crash the Java program, it crashed the Java virtual machine. And it's actually real instructive to see that again because it's an interesting thing to see that. Uh, it's interesting to see what happens when the JVM itself crashes. Uh, no, I'm not getting it. I'm not getting the JV. I have to figure out, I should figure out how to reproduce that because you got really interesting crash. You got a, you got a crash report from the JVM, which, which I'd never seen before. It was real interesting. You know, something like, like when you're working with libraries that are mixed libraries like that. So you know, the Java library, it, it, the crash wasn't in the Java library. The crash was in the C part of it. So then the Java part didn't know what to say. So it gave a really interesting crash report, trying to, trying to tell you as much as it could about what went wrong. Now, I wish I could duplicate that now. We were getting those the other day and now I'm not getting them. Okay, now let's look at another example here. There's, here's a, a texture cube. Okay. So there's a texture on a cube. Okay, looks good. But if you resize the window, it doesn't look so good. Okay. This is one of the problems I cannot figure out. Now, let me show you what, what, I, what I can about this. The code looks pretty much like before. It's just that we're going to load one texture and put it on six different faces. The cube's got six faces. So uh, this example was gotten from here. Here's the original version, but this isn't this. I'm, I'm essentially translating this C code into Java. So there's the original C version. Okay. Now, this is the this constructor doesn't change anything. Okay. Here's the thing that makes that little checkerboard. So that's the same. Okay. Now here's where things get a little bit different. The init function doesn't change. We're initializing one texture. So this init function is the same as it was before. We're initializing one texture. It's display that's different. Okay. What display is going to do, it's going to do a rotation, then draw the cube. Okay. When you draw the cube, you go up here. He wrote it as a separate function. You're going to draw six polygons. The cube has one, two, three, four, five, six faces. Now the cube's got eight corners. Each corner, see this, these are the eight corners. There's corners zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So 
the first space is corners zero, three, two, one. Next space is corners two, three, seven, and eight. So you just imagine a cube, you number the eight, you number the eight vertices with some order. Any four of them will give you a, well, four will give you a face. So draw that face, draw that face, draw that face, draw that face, draw that face. Okay, then to draw faces, up here, this draws a face, okay? Here's where you do, each face is one uh, quad. Each face has one, two, three, four vertices. For each vertex, you want to say, what the color is at that vertex, what texture coordinate goes at that vertex, and where that vertex is in space. So for each corner of the cube, you say, color of the vertex, location, the texture coordinate. Now, here's the interesting thing. There's six, there's, uh, we could be using any number of textures. The texture coordinates are like zero, zero. That's zero, zero of the current texture. Doesn't matter which one of the textures I'm using. If I'm using texture 17, it's 0, 0, 0017. I don't say here texture coordinate of texture 17. I just say texture coordinate 0, 0, which is, and then it just uses whatever is the current texture. This is OpenGL state machine point of view. Yeah, it, instead of saying do this to this texture and do this to this texture, you say this is the current texture. Everything I do is now to the current texture. If I want to do something to some other texture, I have to switch to that as the current texture. You only ever work with one matrix at a time. You only work with one vertex at a time. You only work, see, yeah, you know, at, at this point, this color affects that vertex. If I don't change the color, that will be the color of that vertex too. See, what I've done, as I said, the current color is this guy. So now that's everything is that color until I change the color. The current texture coordinate is this guy. And it's the current texture coordinate of the current texture. And it's going to stay that texture until I change it. Then the current vertex is this guy. Then down here, I say, now change the color. Now, what I'm doing is I'm not making the color of this vertex. I'm setting the color of every vertex that follows until I change the color. It's a state machine, you know, which is a weird way to think. It's a state machine. All right. So this, this uses whatever the current texture is. Okay. And then it works, except it doesn't work. Now, watch what happens real, real carefully. The flow of control is you instantiate the GUI. After you instantiate the GUI, you call init. Now, down here, I put a little printout. When init gets called, you see a hash mark. Now, once init is run, it's up to the GUI. Nothing else is guaranteed to run after that. You need events to happen. Okay, now something is gonna cause you to need to re-display the window. Right now, the re-display is caused by a timer. That's why I have, I have an animation timer here. That timer fires every 24 times a second and draws the, initializes the next frame. So my display method is called 24 times a second. But at the same time, I have a resize method that's called, that's, uh, reshape is called every time I change the shape of a window. I print an at sign on the reshape events. I print a dot on the display events and I print a hash mark on the init. You know, watch when this thing runs. I don't understand this. Oh, it's not, the, oh, yeah, it's which one was it? It's, oh, texture cube. Notice init got called. Then redisplay got called, or reshape. Now, why did reshape get called? The very first time the window's put on the screen, in a sense, it's got a new shape. So. You call init, and it turns out you call reshape right away. Then every 24 times a second, that's driving the, the animation. And the animation responds to things like the keystrokes. So I, if I use the Y key, it rotates around the Y axis. Z key makes me rotate around the Z axis. X key makes me rotate around the X axis, OK? Now, watch what happens. I'm going to cause a reshape event, another one.
that reshape event destroyed my graphics. But the original reshape event didn't. I cannot for the life of me figure out why this is destroying things. It's just a reshape event. We've already called it once. And it gets worse than that. Let me show you one last thing. I'm going to delete everything in the reshape event so that it doesn't do anything. Okay. So here's the reshape function. Just comment it out. And just leave the printf in there. Comment it out except for the printf so we know it got called. Okay, so all it does is that. Okay, so it's not doing anything, but we still see the same behavior. The calling, the, just the calling of the reshape event seems to be destroying the, the, the textures. Okay, so it looks fine. Responds to keyboard events. Oh, the reason it's screwed up right now is the camera's in the wrong place. The camera's too close because we because I commented out all that reshape. Now the camera's in its default look. That's, see what the front of this cube is being sliced off by the near plane and the back of the cube is being sliced off by the far plane. The camera's in the wrong place, but the thing is running correctly, okay? Now, now generate essentially a bogus reshape event and we're all messed up. Remember, that reshape event did nothing but call the reshape function. Somehow calling the reshape function destroyed our textures. I have no idea. And it didn't do that in, it didn't do that in this simple example down here. Oh, now I got that one goofed up. Um, that one, the reshape event works fine. In this one, the reshape event Oh, I, I can't remember, I, I deleted some stuff from this one, so. I don't think, I think I need to check it out. Yeah, see, reshape is okay here. But with the rotate, the only thing I can think of is it's got something to do with the animation. That the display and the animation are somehow not cooperating with each other somehow. This one's got no animation in it. So it's got a reshape, but no animate. But, but an empty reshape method, an empty reshape function destroys the textures. When, when there's, a, when we run out of time, what I was thinking when I was walking over here was to do that one and turn off the animation. I could just do it real quick. But if I turn off the animation, then there's really nothing to see. Oh, it still doesn't like it. Oh, so it's not the animation. See, now, now see, now every resize event drives, see the animation now is only, the only thing causing events is me resizing. So the only thing driving the animation is the resizing, but yeah, it's not that, so it's not the animation itself. So I'm gonna keep trying to figure out like, this stuff is nuts. Yeah, th this is just libraries that are this brittle and this delicate are really hard to work with. You know, libraries, but OpenGL is notorious for this kind of stuff. Oh yeah, you know, 3D graphics is a hard thing to program. 3D graphics is not an easy thing to work with. Okay, we'll quit there, run out of time.